Hebrew lettering system um, in his word. I don't know that. Maybe we're just supposed to learn these particular letters and read these letters, but it all is part of Holy Writ. And so like in the eight verses, my understanding is in the Hebrew language, like Aleph, every one of the verses is going to begin with Aleph. And uh, then the next series of eight verses, every one is going to begin with the letter Bet. And uh, the next eight verses are going to begin with Gimel. You can see how closely related the English language, language is with Hebrew because we still call our language letters, our 26 letters, we call them the alphabet. And uh, so the first two letters in Hebrew are Aleph Bet. Aleph Bet. And so that's because Hebrew gave rise to Greek and Greek gave rise to English. And so it's very, very close as far as language goes. As a matter of fact, that letter Aleph, if you go back to this is what's known as Biblical Hebrew. If you go back before that to what's known as Paleo-Hebrew, it's even more pronounced. But like Aleph looks like an ox. Uh, uh, yoke, an ox yoke. And if you look at our A, obviously our A represents an ox yoke. And you can see Beth like Bethlehem, house of bread, Beth means house. And you can see even in biblical Hebrew that it looks like a two-story house. It represents a two-story house. And our English letter B obviously represents a two-story house. And then uh, Gimel is the Hebrew word for camel. And you can see that it's kind of uh, in a hump shape. And our C is like a camel as well. And Delet is the Hebrew word for tent door. You can kind of see it in Biblical Hebrew that that would represent a tent door. You can certainly see it in English. You know, tent door has two flaps, but a D represents a tent door. And you can go on and on with that. So regardless of who wrote the 119th Psalm, there's about eight different words that represent the Word of God. And basically, in just about, if not in every verse of the Psalm 119, there's only 22 letters in, in Hebrew, so it's 176 verses long, that the Word of God is going to be mentioned in some form or fashion. And so with that in mind, we're going to just look at this prayer. And I'm totally shocked, Brother Dan, that I've read this for obviously many, many years. And I don't know how many times I've read it. But I never noticed that a vast majority of Psalm 119 is about prayer. It's about somebody praying to God. It just totally eluded me. And that's the reason I say I learn stuff from the Bible basically every day, maybe multiple things every day. You cannot, you and I, we can never mine everything there is out of the Word of God. It's just too vast because it's the mind of God. God is the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God. So we need to mine everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's been said the Bible's simple enough, the child can be saved, but it's profound enough the greatest minds can't dig out all the vastness of it. And that is 100% true. Now, I do find it fascinating that Psalms... Now, this was just something that Brother Latta had a preference for. He was my pastor for many years till he died recently. He did not want, like, if I ever said, let's go to Psalm chapter 119. Well, that was a death knell for Brother Latta. You just couldn't do that. He said, Psalms are not chapters, Psalms are Psalms. Because chapters were done much later 
they were actually done by a uh, Cardinal Hugo about 1150 AD is when chapters were put in Holy Scripture, at least in the New Testament. And so that's where chapters came from. But then you get to the book of Psalms, and Psalms have always been individual. This was not done by Cardinal Hugo. They're not artificial divisions. These are something that God himself did. So he would say, you know, you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29, but you go to Psalm 23. It's not a chapter. It's the 23rd Psalm. Now, you might say, well, I don't think that means anything. Well, I mean, I don't think you'll go to hell for necessarily for, for doing it. But it is an interesting distinction nonetheless. Yes. And so with that being said, the longest, I think this is instructive to us, that the longest grouping of Scripture in the Bible is Psalm 119, and it's all about the Word of God. So I think God is trying to communicate to us the importance of His Word. Now, the Word and the Spirit work in tandem. Jesus said, the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Yeah. So, you get the Holy Ghost, on and so forth. But at some point, the Holy Ghost, because he's the author of the Word of God, is going to lead you to a tremendous hunger to the Word of God. And one of the first signs of backsliding is when you do not have a desire, a hunger for the Word of God. Right. Now, I know we need to pray with the Spirit, pray with the understanding also, building up ourselves in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. But there's been many people in the United States that did not know how to read, and they would ask God, they would say, God, I want to learn how to read just so they can read their Bibles. Yes. And uh, there's been many people in the world, believe it or not, they could could not read anything but their Bibles. Like they would just say, if they go to read something else, they couldn't read. You'd be surprised. There's still a lot of people in the world that can't read today. A lot of people in the United States that can't read today. Well, that's nothing to shame somebody on. That's just how they were raised. Different people have different grasp of things. They might could uh, do plumbing in a house or change a tire far better than most people. But they just, for whatever reason, can't read. Or maybe they had to quit school early to take care of their family or something like that. And uh, But there's people, when you get the Holy Ghost, you'll have this desire eventually, at some point, to read the Word of God. The Word of God will just consume you. Because you realize when you're reading the Word of God that you're in the mind of God. And one reason the Word is so absolutely essential is because, okay, you get the Holy Ghost, but you still got a sinful nature. So your, our sinful nature can kind of mix with the Holy Ghost and get us off kilter a little bit. Where the Word, thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto our path. And it will keep us on the straight and narrow. So, whenever somebody's in the Word of God, people with the Holy Ghost tend to get excited. It's like Mary had the Word in her belly. And when she got close to John the Baptist, John the Baptist leapt in the womb. Leapt in the womb. Because he was close to the Word. And so the Word of God is living. It's a living book. It is the only book that reads us as we read it. That's one reason a lot of people don't like to read the Word of God. Is because it's got eyes. It's reading us. That's the same way with preaching. I can be up here and not know anything about anything in people's lives in the congregation. But as the Word of God goes forth, I know I've been in this position many times. It's like, well, that guy's preaching right at me. Uh -huh. Well, that's because the Word of God has eyes. It has 
it, it just knows. It knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And so I guess there has been preachers in time past it. As the old saying went, they took people for their text. But the vast majority of the time, it's just the word of God speaking. And it's like, that preacher's preaching right at me. Yes. Well, what you don't know is there may be a hundred other people out in the congregation saying the same thing. Amen. The preacher's preaching right at me. Because it's, sometimes you say, oh me, oh me, and sometimes you say, amen. But the word of God is going forth. So let's look at this longest of all psalms and all, longest of all uh, groupings, verse groupings in the Bible that's all about the word of God. And so this is where the psalmist begins to pray. And when I say pray, he's talking to God. I know I mentioned to somebody, I had my notes at our uh, servanthood meeting last night that I wanted to say this and I just didn't. It just didn't fit. But uh, I don't want people doing devotions. I want people having a relationship with Jesus. Amen. You know, because sometimes we say, well, I'm doing my devotions. Well, that's good. But sometimes that can become a mechanical. Yes, it can. And well, I did my 15 minutes. I read my 85 verses today that are going to let me read. I checked off my bread chart. God helped me today. And I left. Well, there's and so in the rest of our life, unlike the song we sang, the rest of our life is our own when it's not. So a relationship with God is where you just can't wait to get in your prayer closet and get in communion with Almighty God. And you can't wait to come to the house of God, be in communion with the people of God, hear the word of God. So, and I'll probably still call them devotions. And I've written a devotional, I think. I don't even remember what I've written. But anyhow, um, but we want people to have a relationship with God. Yes. Not just a, I check my 30 minutes off today or whatever. But, you know, God, I want to spend time with you. Yes. So when I say prayer, it's obvious the psalmist is talking to God. We tend to think of God like that old John R. Rice book, prayer, asking and receiving. Well, there's more to prayer to, than that. Yeah. I mean, you can just talk to God. You can have God talk to you and uh, just tell him how great he is and how awesome he is and be thankful. And, and uh, you know, so it's more, it's communication with God. The definition of God is communication with God. There's different types of prayer, supplications and intercessions and on and on. But uh, prayer in its utmost form is intimate communication with God. So... He's talking to God here in verse 4. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. So as we live in the United States of America, I would say that that is probably, if not the biggest, one of the biggest failings of the church in a broad sense of that term in the United States of America is we don't want to keep God's commandments diligently. We kind of want to serve God the way we want to serve God. You know, uh, we have recreational worship and Jesus is my boyfriend songs and, and uh, you know, just get together and my heart pants and it's about to explode in my chest and, and all that. And then you leave and it's been really nice, but you're not really changed. Amen. Amen. And, you, you know, because the word of God has the anointing and it, it breaks the yoke. It destroys the yoke. So um, what we have to remember is the religion of Cain. Let's everybody say the religion of Cain. Religion of Cain is giving God what Cain wanted to give God. Cain worshiped God. God talked to Cain. And he was not saved. That's the least. And so he brought an offering before the Lord. And then Abel brought of the fat of the flock. 
of the first fruit. And so he brought that which God wanted. So that's the reason I say probably one of the biggest failures in American Christianity is God has commanded us to keep his precepts diligently. Yeah. And we tend to say, well, God, you just accept whatever I give you. And you should be happy I'm giving you that. So if somebody says tithes and offerings, it's like, well, you should just be happy for the five bucks I gave you, God. I didn't have to give you that, now did I? Well, see, we're, we're in, as they talk about, a relational dynamic. Well, we're in a bad way in our relational dynamic with God. <laughs> because the relational dynamic with God is not, hey, dude, how are you doing? Even though I've heard a lot of people pray like that, and there may not be necessarily anything. But the big thing is, is God is the heavens as high above the earth. Yes. So is his ways above our ways. So is his thoughts above our thoughts. He's the creator. Yes, he is. And so he is high and holy. And so we're all destined for hell. And God in his grace and mercy says, well, I, I give you an opportunity to go to heaven. That's right. So in the relational dynamic, we don't have anything to bring to the table. Except it, it was only his grace and mercy. There was absolutely nothing we could do to be saved. And so he developed a plan of salvation in his mind where he would come in flesh and take everybody's sins. Even people would hate him and reject him and take them upon his back. And so we don't have anything to offer except our obedient and ourselves. And so the Bible predicted in the end time, 2 Timothy 4, that people could heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Yes. And what that is, okay, so we go here, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. So somebody speaks the truth in love, speaks God's precepts, you know, diligently in love because he cares for somebody's soul. And so he's like, I'm not going to give that up. I can go up the street to a church that doesn't require that of me. Amen. And it's usually bigger and it's usually wealthier and we can pretend we've got big youth groups and blah, blah. And we can have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. And all of this. And so this is, when I say American Christianity, I'm, I'm certainly not here criticizing. I'm very thankful for anybody that gives anything at all to God. But thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Yes. So this means we're supposed to be looking in the word of God. I did a video recently about scriptures most people ignore. It didn't get a ton of views. Two, three hundred, maybe four hundred. I don't know. But I did get a lot of comments. And I was shocked at the number of people that were not apostolic that agreed with that. Because I went into all kinds of scriptures. Like 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 11. And 1 Peter 3, Acts 2, baptism in Jesus' name. And there was a lot of people who said, you know, you're exactly right. Because we want to come to God on our terms. Well, we have, again, we have nothing to offer. And this is what the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost pulls people. This is one reason... You know, we can't force anybody to get the Holy Ghost. It says compel them to come in. But that just is invite. Come on, you know, there's no excuse for you not to come. But we can't give anybody the Holy Ghost. Their heart has to be right to receive the Holy Ghost. Yes. And that's, yes. Yes. you know, that's reason we're not a cult. We don't okay. manipulate anyone. We don't, whatever. We preach the Word of God. We pray. We love. We share. We live for God. And then God has to give the increase. Yes. None of us can give the Holy Ghost. We can pray for people, lay hands on people to receive the Holy Ghost. Same way with healing. We can, lay, we can be obedient to God. And people can be obedient to, to God for asking for healing. But it's only God that can heal. Right. It's only God that can do that. So it's a decision. And so that's the reason we let everybody make their own decision. And uh, the same way, let's just say with something that's uncomfortable for some Christians today, that's very biblical, New Testament, let's say outward standards or something. Well, I can't force anybody to do that. And you can't force anybody to do that. None of us. It's got to be a free will decision yes. to say, okay, I, I love the Word of God. Yes, yes. 
and of course, you know, I'm 58, been around the block a little while. Not as much as Brother Goins, maybe, but around the block a little while. And, uh, you know, you always hear, well, there's people who speak with tongues that don't do that. Well, congratulations. I, I'm not even sure what the point you're trying to make is. They're still in violation of the Bible. The Bible says there'll be a lot of people that prophesy and cast out devils. And God will say, I didn't even know who you were. Matthew 7. So the point is, is we have to humble ourselves to say, okay, God, I want to obey the word of God. And I think sometimes this is why revival rages in third world countries in sometimes not so much in America. And the reason so many people liken the American church to Laodicea, because it said of the Laodiceans, you're rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing. Amen. Now that's not all Americans. There's a lot of poor Americans, a lot of veterans that are homeless. There's a lot of people, uh, hunger and food insecurity and this type of thing. But it's a lot of Americans. And, uh, and so it's uh, very difficult for Americans to humble themselves. We tend to have the same attitude. When I used to sell Bibles, I'll just tell you this, that, okay, one place I worked was near a community known as Lake Spivey. Lake Spivey had a lot of big homes, a lot of extremely wealthy people in it. And so we would have somebody from Lake Spivey come in and say, uh, uh, I would like a Bible. I want to give it to a friend. And I would show them a $20 Bible, which was a nice Bible. It certainly wasn't the best. We had Bibles that sold for two and three hundred dollars. But it was a nice Bible. And they would say, well, don't you have anything cheaper than that? Oh, my. Don't you have anything cheaper than that? They drove in in a Mercedes and all this. <laughs> and this was their thoughts. Yes, Dressed, finest, making even 25 years ago, making hundreds of thousands a year in all of this. 30 years ago. And, but yet, we would have somebody extremely poor. And I don't want to be offensive in this, but like I would have somebody come in and they would pull their wad of money out of the inside of their shirt, out of their bra. And they'd say, I want a Bible. Well, I'd show them a $70, $80 Bible. And they'd say, well, now don't you have something more expensive than that? Well, I'd say yes. We actually ended up having to keep certain expensive Bibles just because of this demographic. And they would come in and say, my pastor says where your treasure is, there where your heart be also. And if I'm going to spend $80 on a pair of shoes, then I need to spend a lot more than that on my Bible. Amen. That's what they would say. And uh, so... It's all about love. And so this is, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Sometimes we can be Laodicean and say, well, you know, I don't need church. I don't need God. Well, that's still trouble hits. But I mean, we all need God every day. But just wait till trouble hits. Backsliding is one of those things that kind of sneaks up on you too. It's a... You know, it just happens. And then I've talked to many backsliders and they said they really didn't even know what was happening. It was like frog in the kettle thing. All of a sudden they turned around they were backsliding. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. So can you say amen for that? Amen. So we need to just say, look, we need to keep your precepts. Your the very uh, precepts, the very smallest part of the word of God. We need to keep that very diligently. It's not our gospel. We didn't pay for it. And so we need to, uh, to do that. Okay, so verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. How many of you know you've got a sinful nature? So you and I have something working against us on the inside of us. The 14 natures of the heart. You know, fornication, anger, lust, covetousness, all of these things mentioned in Mark chapter 7. Also, another one mentioned in the book of Matthew. And so the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all things. Deceitful. It'll tell you it's saved when it's not. And so we have a sinful nature. So all oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. So even when we have the Holy Ghost, sometimes that sinful nature is saying, 
hold a grudge. All right. Be angry. All right. Be mean. Don't mm -hmm. don't talk right to that person. Come on, Just man, right? all of these kind of things. Come Lust. On. These type things. So, oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. So this is the reason we have to yield to God. We have to surrender to God and uh, live for Jesus Christ. We have to just say, God, I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to you. And so, because left to our flesh, our flesh will deceive us. Yes, it will. It'll say we're saved when we're not saved. Yes, it will. And so, this is very important. Oh, that my ways were direct to keep thy statutes. So, God, Jesus said this in John. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. That's right. So, we tend to use that in worship. I do think it applies to worship, but in its primary context, he says, because I went to the cross, my spirit was going to tug on everybody's heart. Yes. If I be lifted up, because it says very clear that he meant the cross there, I will draw all men to myself. Yes. And so in John 1, it says, Jesus is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh unto the world. Paul's preaching to a bunch of pagans in Acts 17. He said, though God be not far from every one of us. So God is pulling. When we go to witness to somebody, God's already been talking to them. God's already been ministering to them. And so this is the process of drawing and conviction. And this is, uh, you hear preaching, whoever's up here preaching or teaching, or even just reading the Bible yourself or listening to the Bible, and you hear something and you're like, oh, and you realize this is something I'm not doing. Well, that's conviction. So then we can either harden our hearts or we can soften our hearts and say, God, I want to do that. Help me to do that. And so it's a free will action. So that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. This is the reason we have to stay prayed up. We have to talk to the Lord. Yes. So we can be directed to keep the word of God. Yes. So then verse 6. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Now you'll notice he's talking to God here. This is Psalm 119 prayer. And he's saying, so I'm not going to be ashamed when I have respect to every single one of your commandments. So again, what humanity tends to do is to be like Saul. You know, Brother Goins, there's a bunch of Amalekites, and I killed a bunch of them. And I killed a bunch of animals. But God told me to kill them all. Uh -huh. I really appreciated the General Youth Division a few years ago. Their, um, what would you call it, not motto, their slogan or something like that was 99.5% just won't do. And so that's really true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I know a lot of people, I've talked to people. They said, you know, Pastor, I've read Saul and I've read what Cain did and I don't see what they did that was so bad. Oh my. Well, the thing is, what they did that was so bad is they didn't give everything to Jesus. That's right. They gave a lot to Jesus. We have to give everything to Jesus. I can remember when I got the Holy Ghost. How I got the Holy Ghost was when I finally gave up basketball. And you might say, basketball? Yeah. I used to play basketball usually four to six hours a day, rain or shine, for years. It was just my release. It's what I did. And so I'm laying on the ground with six guys praying for me. And I, I tell God, they don't know this is going through my mind. I'm like, God, this is ridiculous. I've got six grown men praying for me while I'm laying here on the ground. And God's like, just give up basketball. I'm like, really? <laughs> Seriously? You want me to give up basketball? Now, you know, I'm like, okay, God, if you want basketball, you got it. And then I'm like, so God, if you're real and the Holy Ghost is real, I want, boom, I got the Holy Ghost immediately. So we have to give up everything. And this is the reason at altar work, we don't want to uh, have people fake it till they make it. We don't want people to blah, blah around 
you know, repeat after me in tongues and all of this. Amen. It's got to be as the Spirit gives the utterance. Right. Yeah. Because we want them to get the real thing. Yes. Right. We want them to get the real Holy Ghost. And uh, sometimes people think they can force people to get the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's been times that maybe I've been on a long fast or an extended fast or been on a few days of really long prayers every day and you almost feel brother Bigelow like you can shove the Holy Ghost or shove healing or deliverance down somebody's throat well you can't their heart has to be open Jesus says I stand at the door and knock if any man will let him open the door and so and it's strange sometimes, Brother Dan, the impression our young people get. I was talking to a backslider young person. She's turned into an atheist and a therapist and a very good young lady. She was part of our youth group. But I was talking to her, this is many, many years ago, why did you become atheist? And she said, well, she said, I learned that I didn't have to do what the Holy Ghost wanted me to do. Oh, my we used to have such powerful services, still do here some. They used to have just powerful services. And she thought that when the Holy Ghost really just overwhelmed her, she had to do what God said. Oh my. And she figured out that she could quench the Spirit. Oh my. She figured out she didn't have to do that. And so she started saying, well, if God was God, he would make me worship him. And since I can resist him, there must not be a God. And I'm like, well, that's not really great thinking. Now, this girl, she's got a doctorate, I think, PhD. And I uh, don't mention names, obviously. But... She doesn't live, to my knowledge, in this state any longer. But, and I'm not on social media, so who knows. But, um, but this is, that was her thinking. And I've talked to other young people that had the same thoughts. They're like, well, if I can resist God, the key is you're not supposed to sit back there and, and hold out to the bitter end till finally, okay, God, that's not what you're supposed to do. Amen. You're supposed to, I come running to the mercy seat. Amen. We're supposed to give ourselves. Amen. Amen. So totally unto God. And the reason so many people don't give themselves totally unto God is because they're scared of what they feel God's going to tell them to do. I remember we had a young man. He was three years getting the Holy Ghost. He's one of the greatest Christians I've ever met in my life. Finally got the Holy Ghost. But he's three years getting the Holy Ghost. And so I'm preaching like this, and he would say, You mean I got to do whatever God wants me to do? I was like, Yes. You remind us so much of him, Brother Dan. You really do. He lives in Ohio now. He married an IBC girl. And uh, just a great Christian. And so he would come to me. And one thing that was hindering him from getting the Holy Ghost, he says, well, what if God tells me to marry an ugly girl? <laughs> and we're like, well, Brother Dan, first of all, God does all things well. He's only, he wants your best. So you just let God handle that. But well, don't you think God would let me be halfway attracted to the girl that I was going to marry? Well, yes. But Brother Dan, you need to be focusing on Jesus. Amen. But see, this really hindered him. He was scared that if he gave everything to God, that God was, because, you know, he's 6'2", fit, trim, and all this, and look like a model. And he, he just was scared to death that if he gave everything to Jesus, Jesus, that God was going to have him marry somebody he was not attracted to. I want you to marry that person. And he, oh, so he wrestled for three years. I remember Brother Taylor when he first when he got the Holy Ghost. We had a missionary, and we're talking to him about getting the Holy Ghost. He's standing up the wall over here in our other church, and uh, we just told him, "Have you repented? Yes. Well, do you believe God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost? Yes." And we said, well, just call on Jesus. Worship the name of Jesus. Jesus, boom, he starts talking in tongues. And we were like, what's going on? You've got the Holy Ghost. He said, it's that easy? We're like, yeah, it's that easy. 
once you repent we had a young lady sister clark brought to church with her we were teaching a bible study to her at uh, sister clark's house this was a few years back i can remember you know we'd go through the bible she would believe everything and she would repent of her sins she got baptized and then when she came up she said well the holy ghost okay holy ghost for you she knew it lifts her hand just begins speaking with tongues just like the book of acts and so what hinders so many is we're, we don't want to let go because we're afraid of what God's going to tell us. That's right. God wants me to be single. I remember watching a Christian comedian recently and she was like, God, help me through this season of singleness. It is a season, isn't it? <laughs> Well, see, what we have to do is not my will, but yours be done, Jesus. Amen. You have to say, God, I want what you want. So, I shall not be ashamed when I have respect unto all. Let's everybody say all. all. All thy commandments. So, this is something that's very big. That word, all. You'll find in the Bible, some of the most consequential words are very short. Everybody's like, well, I don't think I can understand the Bible, especially the King James. I'm like, well, can you understand all? But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. He died for us. Can you understand for and us? Five letters, two words total. Yeah, okay. It's not that hard. But again, this is where self-will comes in. Is uh, We don't necessarily want... And even sometimes after we've got the Holy Ghost... We have a very difficult time. This is the reason Paul had to encourage the church at Thessalonica. Which is a fascinating church. He was only there three weeks before they ran him out of town. And Acts 17. That quench not the spirit. Because if, now could you imagine if we did a Holy Ghost monitor. You know, like Elon Musk, the intelligence agencies just paid Elon Musk. I hope they don't cut my microphone off for saying this. I mean, it's all in the common news. To, uh, to make satellites to look at every square inch on planet Earth. Mama. You know, they're going to do that. Could you imagine if we could see from God's perspective on the thing? So worship is going on. We're all worship service and people are working. Could you imagine if we saw all at once everybody's heart? You know, it said in pew one, seat two, this is it. But everybody's heart. Pew two, pew three. And saw everybody's heart. Well, I wonder if we would see any quenching of the spirit. Jesus. Because again, now, when I was kind of growing up in Pentecost, there was this common misperception that you were just supposed to sit there and fight God to the bitter end. And then when God finally took over, you do. Ah! And you just, and now, and sometimes people aren't doing that. God's just taking them. And so people just, ah! And nobody would worship till God literally just threw them in the middle aisle. I don't know if y'all remember those days. That, that was common where I was at. It was just common. So now we, I'm very grateful. We live in a generation that worships God out of their own will. Yes. They don't just wait for God to just you just have to smack them and say to worship. We're supposed to worship God for His excellent greatness. Right. And again, I'm not, don't ever judge somebody that, ah, that they're probably having a great relationship with God. Yes. I'm just telling you what it was like way back in the day in certain parts of Pentecost. Yes. And so it shouldn't be that way. God inhabits the praises of His people. So we, we shouldn't just wait on God to literally throw us out in the middle aisle before we worship. Yeah. We should be bringing a free will offering. Yes. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Yes. Amen. Hebrews 13, 15. So then shall I not be ashamed that I have respect unto all thy commandments. So could you imagine if we could see everybody's heart, you know, who's quenching the spirit? Mama. Yeah. Well, God sees everybody's heart. Yes, he does. Man. So we just need to worship God according to his excellent greatness, because the great his mighty acts towards us, and on and on and so forth. Amen. And so, uh, 
verse 7, I, sh I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, his decisions. So, the first thing we have to do is, God, how do I please God? I had a friend of mine, Brother Bigelow. He was preaching at a very large church in Louisiana. And he said, I feel led of God that we're supposed to go on a fast. The whole church is supposed to go on a seven-day fast. So, the whole church is dying on this seven-day fast. Well, he was staying in a hotel. And so the pastor drives by Dairy Queen and sees him at Dairy Queen with a big milkshake. You may know who I'm talking about. They just had his funeral a few months ago with a big milkshake. And the pastor's like, what in the world? We're dying. He said, well, I thought on a fast you could drink what you want. He said, so I've been coming up here. He said, I couldn't fast seven days. He said, but these milkshakes help. <laughs> well, see, he had not learned <laughs> all God's righteous judgments. <laughs> he didn't know everything he was supposed to do. Right. And so we shall worship God with uprightness of heart. And because when you go to John chapter 4, it says he seeks such to worship him, those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so this is who God is looking to worship him. Yes. Because there's going to be a lot of people that worship God that did not serve God. Amen. Praise God, did not live for God. Amen. Again, we live in a day of recreational worship. So Psalm 119 is this prayer. You can see he's still talking to God. I will praise thee with brightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. So this is the reason my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and my people are taken into captivity because they have no knowledge. These elders we've got here, brother and sister Goins, many other elders that have served God for many decades, you need to look at their life and say, how did you make it through? Because they've got the fruit of experience. They've made it. Not to heaven yet, but they've made it to this point over many decades right. through many toils and snares. So I'll praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. And so this is what God desires is for us to learn the things of God, learn how to please God. And uh, so God. just serve God, worship God. Because sometimes when you're just totally given let's say just to worship or something and it's good and, and all this I've seen so many people that were in that way that get led astray because they don't have the word to put the guardrails and guide them and to show them the way they should go so this is the Psalm 119 prayer you can go on all the way actually to 176 verses and look at the prayers so I just want to encourage you to yield yourself to God to surrender to God 100% and uh that is what God desires. Even people that are lost. The reason like Charles Finney's revivals and stuff and John Wesley's revivals. People would just be writhing on the ground. That's that process of death. It's like God not my will but thine be done. And so we just have to say God. So many people are scared. Well if I give my whole self to Jesus he's going to call me to Africa. Or he's going to call me to Asia. And even worse than that, he's going to call me to stay in my home church. Because <laughs> we get that a ton at IBC. They're like, God, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. Somebody will whisper a word. You're supposed to go back to your home church and help out. Like, I meant like Asia or Russia, not there. <laughs> that happens a ton. Amen. Let's pray together and ask God to help us yield our lives to Him. Why don't we all stand if you can? Hallelujah. God, we glorify you. We love you, Jesus. Help none of us. I don't ever want to quench your spirit, Jesus. Help us all to be humble before you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us give ourselves holy to you, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service. We love you, God. And God, let us maybe pray sometime this Psalm 119 prayer. 
and God it will make a big difference in our lives God you know best we want to be led of the spirit led of the spirit God in the name of Jesus we love you God we love you we praise you in Jesus name in Jesus name y'all heard me tell this many times I just feel like I need to repeat it's like brother Kilgore at Life Tabernacle his church never exploded to the heights it got till he was rolled on the ground. He said God kept speaking to him, roll on the ground. Amen. And he said the fourth time God told him, he said, I'm going to write Ichabod over the doors unless you roll on the ground. He did. And the church went from three or 400 to 1,700. Came the first United Pentecostal Church to sponsor every missionary. And so, but you, we just have to yield. Sometimes God might tell you to run. You might say, well, where's running in the Bible? Well, David said, I've run through a troop, leapt over a wall, running, leaping, praising God. And... Uh, Yes, he did. Elijah, Elijah, when the Spirit of God hit him, he outran a chariot. Yes, he did. So running is in order, jumping, leaping, rolling, whatever God tells you to do. Unless it's out of order, like come take the microphone and start spouting off nonsense. That wasn't God, that was your flesh. Hallelujah.